Good morning, church. It is a great privilege to be with here you this morning again. Uh, it's always a great privilege for me and uh, for any person I know to be able to share the Word of God with someone else. But I think there's no greater privilege for a human being to be able to share the gospel with another human being. And this is what we've been doing with the, with the church this uh, past few weeks and we'll be doing, continue to do so to Easter Sunday. And uh, I'm going to share with you today the Garden of Gethsemane, as we as we had in the reading. When I was younger, I used to always watch these uh, Japanese anime, and um, and I loved it, these type of cartoons. And um, I always saw how the hero would always find um, this level of serenity, you know. And they had these uh, these philosophies about you know the yin and the yang and the, the balance that would come. And then they would find the perfect moments of serenity, and then they would get the power they needed to be able to defeat their foe. And now as a Christian, I, talk to, I think to myself, I've always thought to myself, what power do I have in my life? What does the Word of God teach me about the power that I have? What have I been taught? What have I been given? And in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a power to be found. And that is what we're going to look for together today. The power in the Garden. So rather than a, a massive... Uh, uh, philosophy or, or theology, more um, with lack of a better word, or, or sermon. This is more of a devotional. I felt in my heart that today, finding the power of the God, and we're going to be doing it together as a devotional. We look straight away in Matthew, in verse 37 and 38. I had a song in my head, because uh, when I was preparing my, any devotional, any talks, I was trying to listen to, to worship. Uh, it's, it's my way of of sometimes getting myself um, uh, in the moment, trying to get myself really working in the spirit to just worship God and to say thanks to him for everything that he does. And the song came up in my head and it kept going over and over and again. And I thought there was a confirmation from God as to what he wanted me to uh, guide you today through the spirit, through the words in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that song is Here I Am to Worship. And especially the moment when it says, I'll never know how much it cost. I'm not going to sing it. I don't want to put that through for you for that moment. But it says, I don't know how much it cost. I'll never know how much it cost for you to go on that cross. Um, I don't think a human being can comprehend what Jesus went through. But if there is a hint, if there is a shed of light of what it cost Jesus, it's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says in verse 37b, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. In verse 38 it says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. In Luke's version of events in chapter 22 verse 44 it says, being in anguish he prayed more earnestly. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. These are the type of words that describe what it cost. Jesus had in his shoulders all my sins, all your sins, and all the world's sins. Think a moment about what we're saying now. Every human being, there's seven billion and plus at this moment in time on this planet Earth. Seven billion sins and over. He carried on the cross. He carried on his shoulders and he began to feel that moment in the garden. He was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. His blood, his, his sweat was like blood falling to the ground. That begins to describe only if just a little bit what it meant for Jesus to die on the cross for us. You see, the Garden of Gethsemane interprets Calvary for us. It puts it into context. In the garden, in that moment of darkness, a great moment of description of seeing the darkness in the garden. There's no light, there's no electricity there to light up the, the garden at that moment in time. They were in pure darkness. It was just him and the disciples. And he was at his darkest, most difficult moment. And that's how much it cost. He was willing to go all the way he was obedient to the end. But there's another element to this now. Not only what it was costing him, but also 
what was going at work in his heart. Because this is what we hear in verse 39. It says in Matthew verse 39, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In, uh, in Luke's version, in verse 42 and 44, it says, May you will be done. Here we see Jesus' words. We know how he's feeling. He's feeling overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And his sweat is like blood. But in his heart, he's looking to the Father. He is saying, let your will be done. In his most deepest, most gravest moment, Jesus looked to the Father. What does that teach us today? That's the first thought we have to consider. He looked for the Father. Jesus is the example of perfect balance. Remember at the beginning I said to you, these heroes in this anim that I used to see, they used to find perfect balance. Well, in the Bible, there is perfect balance. And the balance that the Bible talks about is Jesus' balance. Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see them at work. We see the sorrow. We see the overwhelming trouble. We see that he's feeling to the point of death. And that's his human part. He was 100% human. That's why he could die for us. Because he knew all of our sufferings. All of our sufferings of every human being. No matter where you're from, no matter man or woman, where part of the world, Jesus knew. Jesus encountered this trouble. Jesus felt the weight on his shoulders. But even then we see the next part, the other part of the balance. He's 100% God. He's 100% thinking about us. Not what I feel, not, what, not, not my decision. Let your will be done. He was obedient to the end because... And it is here that we find the key to the power in the garden, which we're going to elaborate on. And that is his love and more importantly in today, his grace. You see, the key to understanding Christianity is understanding grace. Grace means, as a, want, as a way of putting it, a gift that I did not deserve. Grace means to be given something even though you deserve something else. Jesus took the place of humanity and he was feeling the burden in the Garden of Gethsemane. But even then, his grace was too powerful that he wanted to fulfill it to the end. And when I think back on all my troubles and all my struggles, I can never compare to what Jesus went through. No human being can compare. Jesus drank from a cup. Remember, he says, Lord, if it's possible, put this cup from away from me, as he says in Mark's version of events. And Jesus drank from a cup that no other human being could go through. So when we are suffering, look to the garden, look to the grace found in the garden, and you will see the comfort and the joy and the serenity and the power that it brings to your life. It's life changing. There's only two ways about it. You either accept it or you don't. But your heart is confronted with something that no matter what you did, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're going through, no matter how impossible it seems, grace is more powerful. And grace penetrates the heart, the deepest thoughts, the deepest desires, and it confronts it with God's love. Because we were given something that we did not deserve. We were given eternal life and salvation even though we did not deserve it. It was meant to be us on that cross. It was meant to be us overwhelmed with sorrow and despair and to the point of death. But Jesus was faithful to the end. Now, I have said that Garden of Gethsemane interprets Calvary. And to give you a new light, to give you a new interpretation of what we're talking about here, we're going to go to another section of the story because we've talked about Jesus being overwhelmed, the weight on his shoulders we've seen that he's 100% God and 100% man and we see this perfect balance that we were talking about secondly we see that the key to Jesus going to the end was that he showed us his grace his love his determination to fulfill it to the end and this key 
of grace opens up an incredible um, power in, in our lives. And we're going to see someone who experienced this power. And we're going to compare it to, uh, to what the disciples were going through at that particular time. So as you know, in the story, in this part of Gethsemane, the disciples were there, but they were asleep. They were asleep during this time. But we're going to see, we're going to compare the, this, these servants, the disciples, to another servant of God. And we're going to see the difference as to who, at this moment in particular time, appreciated more God's grace. If we go to Psalm 61, we see a Psalm of David. And this one allows us to see a man who has experienced God's grace and what it meant to him. As a comparison to the disciples who were falling asleep just when Jesus was being overwhelmed with sorrow and struggling to the point of death. In Psalm 61, it says, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. This is David speaking. From the ends of the earth I call to you, I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For I have heard you uh, have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the heritage to those who fear my, your name. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. I point your love and faithfulness to protect him. Then I will forever sing the praise to your name and fulfill my vows day after day. You see, David, it is believed, wrote this psalm when he was being uh, chased by Absalom, his son, who wanted to overtake his throne. And it's believed that he was hiding somewhere in the desert. A man who was being chased to the point of death, he knew that his life depended on it. And in that darkness, in that cave, I can imagine David, a warrior, just like Gideon, when he went to drink of the river, have you read that story in the book of Judges? When, they, when he went to uh, drink the river, they used to hold the water in their hand and drink the water this way. So that way they could constantly watch, keep watch and stay awake. And what was Jesus saying to the disciples in the story? Keep watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. Well, David, had he was experiencing this, but David, rather than being asleep, he was awake and watching. And he was thinking constantly about the Father in that moment in time. And he was saying, from the ends of the earth, I called to you. I called as my heart grows faint. Just like his ancestor, Jesus' his heart was going faint in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was calling to the Father. What does that teach us? David experienced grace in his life more than any other person. He committed murder. He committed adultery. He committed so many sins that... Any man would have been punished by, by death, but he witnessed God's grace and power. He had a heart towards God. And that is what is teaching us now. He had felt God's grace. And this is, this is what strikes me the most. In verse 4, he says, I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You see, in those days, they didn't have a Jesus. Jesus hadn't come yet. God had, been, God had promised to David that Jesus would come, that his... Uh, the Messiah will come for his lineage. But Jesus wasn't there. At the time, they had the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, they had these two angels, these two seraphim of wings. So when he says, um, I take refuge in the shelter of your wings, he was trying to say that in that tabernacle was God's presence. Because he knew that if he was in God's presence, he would be protected. He knew that all the weight that was on his shoulders would be released if he could only just feel God's grace in his life. He knew it would change his life forever. He knew he felt the honey and the sweetness in being in God's grace during his most difficult struggles. I long to dwell in your tent forever. Now the disciples, they had the living God right there and there in the garden of Gethsemane. And they were asleep. And David was in a cave, struggling for his life. And oh, how he desired Oh, how he wanted God's presence and God's grace in his life. Just one more time, God. Save me from this one. <laughs> Save me from this one, Lord. Give me your grace just one more time. Save me from this one. I long to be in your tent. I long to be under cover of your wings. 
And when you see the wings uh, mentioned here in verse 4, look what it says in Luke. What did the Father do to Jesus in this moment in time? In verse 33 of chapter 22, it says, An angel appeared from heaven and strengthened him. Jesus had the Father's love, his Father's love to strengthen him. An angel appeared in his moment of struggle. David knew that as the sons of God, that as children of God, as servants of God, we don't have an angel to serve us. We have Jesus to serve us. We have the Saviour to serve us. And we have his overabundant grace to cover us and to fulfill us with hope and joy. You see, grace is the power in the garden. David experimented it. He asked for it to be increased in the days of his life. He asked for more generations. He served 40 years. But it prophetically in verse 7 it says, May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Upon your love and faithfulness to him to protect him. He wasn't talking about himself because him and Solomon conquered, uh, reigned about 40 years and then they died of old age. The Bible tells us. It was obvious he was talking about the Messiah here. And God protected him, showed his love and faithfulness to him, even in his darkest moment. Jesus was enthroned in God's presence forever because of his love and because of his grace. You see, I'm going to throw you a quick theology now lesson here. You see, we know God because of the attributes that he has shown to us through his word. And one of those attributes is grace. One of God's attributes is to be immutable, to be unchangeable. His love has always been the same. His grace has always been the same. And has always been at work. It was at work in that cave for David. It was at work powerfully next to the disciples, even though there were stones thrown away, which is what it says in Luke. They had him right there. And they were asleep. Are you awake or are you asleep? God's grace is right there. All you have to reach out, all you have to do is reach out and, re and reach it. That's it. Put up your hand and reach it. Open your heart and reach it. The grace is there. The power to change your life is there. That is what Christianity teaches and that is the foundation of our faith. Grace is there. Open your heart. Let go of your fears. Let go of your pride. Let go of your sin that is weighing you down like a heavy, heavy building on top of your shoulders. A heavy ton pulling you down. Let go of it. Let Jesus come. I'll finish off with two, uh, two different parts of the scripture in the New Testament that talk to us. In Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, it tells us a bit about this power in the garden. It tells us a bit about this power of grace. In Ephesians chapter 1, Verses 5 to 8, it says, He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of his grace. To share the gospel is to share grace and is to share riches with another human being. Do you want those riches? Open your heart. Are you sleeping as a disciple? You've had this grace before. You've accepted Jesus in your heart. Are you asleep? Are you asleep? The grace is there. Open your eyes. David needed it. He knew he needed it. In Romans 5, 20 to 21, Romans 5, 20 to 21, it says, The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, Grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, David knew the power in God's grace, and he wanted it. He needed it. He wanted to be in the tabernacle under the presence of God's wings. I long to dwell in your tent forever. He says in verse 8, sing praise to your name. I will fulfill my vows every day. And Jesus says to the disciples, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Two worlds collide. Jesus fulfills 
the promise that was given to David and we see in Psalm 61 that he will fulfill it, that he was faithful. I beg you now, if you haven't been to the garden, come to the garden and find the power inside because it is life changing. Grace is life changing. Grace brings eternal life. Grace brings forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. And thank you for carrying our weight on your shoulders. Thank you for going all the way to the cross because it showed us how much it cost to you. I want to pray now. Lord, I thank you for what you did on the cross and for what Hefsemini, the Garden of Hefsemini means to us. You showed us how much it meant to you. Lord, allow us to be awake, not asleep. Thankfully, we see in the work in the book of Acts how the disciples were awake and how your grace was abounding. Because as in Romans, it says that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. To abound even more, it means that there's limitless. If your attribute of grace is limitless, Lord, let us come and reach it. Let us go into the garden and find this power. I pray that if anyone has never experienced this power, to come to you and let him experience the power of grace, the power of salvation. Let him come to the cross. I pray in Jesus' name that you abound us and that your grace abounds in our life every single day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church, for listening. David was in a cave. But the grace is like a sun. It's always there. So no matter how deep you hide today in 2021, you can go to the deepest part of the ocean. You can go to the darkest room, to the darkest cave. But God's grace is like a sun. And it's shining. Come and experience God's grace. Come to the power in the garden. God bless you, church.